Hey team, Andre from High Performance Academy. Welcome to another one of our webinars. And this week we're going to be discussing some of the options that are available to us when it comes to torque management with our aftermarket and for that matter, factory engine management systems. And what I'm really talking about here is uh, adjusting the torque delivery of the engine to suit both the driver as well as the amount of traction that's available. And a lot of people may think, well, why don't we just rely on traction control? But as we move through today's lesson, you'll find that uh, really what we want to do is optimize the amount of torque that we can put to the track and then have that traction control there as a bit of a, a safety backstop in case we maybe just get a little bit uh, optimistic and exceed the amount of traction that is available. Available. So we'll move into that shortly. Before we do that, just some updates on what's been going on over the last week or so. Really happy to report that we finally did get back to the track with our SR86 to test it out with a new aero on it. So we'll just jump across to my laptop screen and have a quick look at what we've got going on. And I know that I've been talking about this a little bit over the last few weeks and I think Tim's been mentioning it as well. So some of you probably getting a little bit sick to death of it, but I'm pretty interested in it so hopefully you can bear with us for one more run through. Uh, so this is the car at the moment at Highlands Motorsport Park and a couple of things here obviously the rear of the car we've got the uh, top stage composites uh, rear wing that's all mounted up there if I can get my little pen to draw. It's not going to draw today. That's helpful isn't it? Uh, and we went to a lot of trouble and I've talked about this again previously. We went to a lot of trouble to make sure uh, that everything is mounted really really securely. Uh, when you've got a rear wing that could be delivering several hundred kilograms of downforce at high speed it, it sort of makes sense. You really want to take the time to make sure that that is really going to be transmitting that uh, nice and firmly down into the chassis rather than flexing away on the uh, boot lid or something like that which I see time time and time again. We've also got of course the diffuser at the rear as well. Uh, now at the front we've got a, a front splitter uh, designed to basically give us some aero balance so we don't have all of the, the downforce at the rear and one of the things with the aero kit we weren't too sure on where we were going to end up with our ride height. Uh, obviously we've got some reasonably expensive carbon bits hanging off the front and the rear of this car now and we didn't really want to end up destroying them so uh, this little uh, silver gizmo that we've got here is uh, the a titanium rubbing block. We've got these on both ends of the front splitter as well as a couple in the middle. The idea of course is that these are going to contact the ground before our expensive carbon bits. They are designed as a bit of a consumable uh, and it looks like we're about right. We ended up just barely kissing that one on the front right although uh, still probably working up to a maximum attack on the car. Uh, one of the aspects here is we may end up adjusting the actual ride height. The downforce or the sensitivity of the downforce to ride height is quite critical so uh, essentially within reason of course the lower we can run the car uh, the more effective the diffuser at the rear and the splitter at the front become. Uh, also back into the shop here but just to show you we ended up with some uh, end plates for that rear wing that have been uh, sort of uh, a work in progress over the last few months so pretty happy to report that everything went really well out on track. Uh, no real problems other than a, a minor issue with our alternator. If you are wondering about that front uh, bumper that is going to end up getting wrapped the same as the rest of the car. Uh, it's just a new aftermarket or a new in-house built fiberglass bumper by both Brandon and Jimmy our fabricator. Uh, they've been beavering away over the last few weeks getting that dialed in so that sort of suits the new front splitter. It's important to seal that front bumper to the splitter for maximum effect and also it does a better job of channeling airflow into uh, the various coolers on the front of the car. So uh, there was a lot to learn. That was Wednesday last week and that was my first opportunity to get out, out on track with a car that actually has uh, a reasonable amount of aer aerodynamic downforce. Obviously it's not a Formula 1 car. Uh, I'll admit it's, there's, a, there's a lot of cars out there with a lot more aerodynamics on it than this but still nevertheless it did make a huge amount of difference. We weren't out there really to try and set any new personal bests and we were on some pretty rinsed old slicks from last season so they definitely seen better days. It was really uh, more of a uh, sort of a shakedown test to make sure that nothing was going to fall off. Uh, even that being said without really trying to put in uh, a full hard lap I still actually managed to shave about half a second off my PB which given that I really wasn't trying is quite surprising. The other aspect with the car is it is 
definitely going to take for an amateur driver like myself, it's going to take a, a fair bit of seat time to really start to trust the aero. Uh, there is a, a long left hand high speed corner at Highlands Motorsport Park, just taken in fifth gear at around about 170 kilometers an hour, maybe 165k. And uh, previously with no aero, on a really good lap where you're right on the edge, the, the car's basically just moving around, uh, moving into a bit of oversteer the whole way through that corner. And it was a little bit bumpy through there as well. So the car is really like absolutely on the limit. And it is a bit, uh, a sort of a take a deep breath and hope as you go through that corner if you're right on the limit. Uh, it took me four sessions and I still hadn't found the limit. We were 13 kilometers an hour faster through that corner, which for anyone who has spent time on a racetrack is uh, literally an eternity. The other part was even at that point, my last lap through there, uh, I still wasn't at, I wasn't flat on the throttle. I'm pretty much 100% confident I could have been and the car even where I was going 13 kilometers an hour faster felt absolutely rock solid and planted. So it's just going to be a lot of getting up to speed with learning how to drive a car now uh, with just that much more downforce. So uh, look forward to to uh, getting a little bit more seat time in it which hopefully will be tomorrow afternoon. Uh, just another one of the slides on my laptop as well. Uh, again, if you've been following us for a while, I did mention that we are going to be building a bit of a, a gurney lip on the back of the, the diffuser here. And we're going to sort of essentially try a blow-in diffuser. Uh, and at the moment, we've got a temporary muffler in place that will be just for our testing given the noise constraints. Didn't quite have a time to get that gurney flap uh, built up. So this is just a temporary heat shield that Jimmy made up. But even that, you can see how the exhaust gas has actually peeled that open where it was folded over on itself. So just to show you uh, how much exhaust flow is going on there. So hopefully we'll have all of that ready to go. We've got four weeks pretty much to the day uh, for our first event, which will be the first round of the South Island Endurance Championship at Ruapuna, which is in Christchurch, around about six hours north of where we are. Uh, some other interesting aspects as well that we found with the data. So I'll just switch across to i2 Pro here. And obviously there's a lot to take in here. Uh, Tim's been going through the data and really uh, the this is just some cursory findings as I mentioned, 13 kilometers an hour faster uh, through, I'll just show you. So that's the corner there that I was talking about that we come through there at around about uh, 165 kilometers an hour thereabouts and as you can see it leads up to uh, a very sharp hairpin. Anyway, there's a couple of things I wanted to show you here. We do now have uh, shock travel potentiometers on the car which is a new addition. A uh, couple of reasons why we wanted those on the car. One of them is it does allow us to do some analysis of the way the dampers are operating. Obviously we can see the actual position of the dampers as we move around the track so we can see the ride height of the car as well or at least to do something about the ride height. It is quite a noisy signal but we can check uh, how the bump and rebound settings of our dampers are operating. So uh, we'll just head over to the suspension page here and I'll just show you uh, a little bit of what we're looking through. So for a start, uh, suspension position, so that's the information that we've got at the top here and as I've said obviously it is quite noisy data. Uh, we want to be able to log this at a reasonably high speed as well for the damper analysis uh, somewhere in the region of between 250 and 500 hertz so 250 to 500 times per second which is what we're doing here. The interesting part of this is uh, this section here that I've got highlighted uh, if we look at our corrected speed here, uh, we started at about 210 kilometers an hour. So this is uh, the breaking point into a, a section of the racetrack called the bus stop. So it's a fairly fast right left hand chicane. Uh, and what we've done here is purposely bypass this. And you can see on the throttle what I've done is just simply close the throttle completely. And what we're doing is what's called a coast down test. So Essentially what we're looking at is the ride height of all four corners through our damper positions versus what we had perhaps stationary in the pits or at very low speed. From this we can deduce to a degree sort of how much downforce we're getting as well as the downforce relationship front to rear. Having gone through this in too much detail at a cursory glance it looks like we're dropping uh, around about 7 to 10 millimetres uh, perhaps at that 210 kilometres an hour. Now of course in order to actually learn anything sensible about that we also need to go through and consider our spring rates front and rear as well as the motion ratio particularly with the multi-link suspension at the back. Uh, but while as I've mentioned it is 
is noisy data. We're obviously picking up undulations and bumps in the road as well. So it does need to be taken with a bit of grain of a bit of a grain of salt here. Uh, we do get a, a pretty good idea, or at least a guide as to what the arrow is doing and what our balance is front to rear. So uh, pretty excited to dig into that in a bit more detail. I have literally just had a look at this data for the first time uh, earlier today, so I haven't dived in too deep. The other part of this is our suspension histogram. So what this is looking at it's, is the uh, the velocity of the damper in terms of millimetres per second and uh, we can see if we look at our top left here uh, on the right hand side we've got the bump uh, travel and then on the left hand side we've got rebound travel so bump obviously uh, compression as the suspension is being compressed uh, rebound as it's extending and uh, we've got as well some markings here some some labels we've got low speed and high speed here uh, so this is nothing to do with the speed of the car what we're looking at here is the speed of the damper travel so low speed is generally considered to be anything that it, there's the driver influence so where we're actually moving the steering wheel and that's causing the car to uh, to body roll uh, or using the brakes and accelerate at a pitch, that's relatively low speed. High speed is undulations in the road, so bumps, curbs, etc. And what we can do here is have a, a, a get a better idea of the balance of our shock uh, valving in terms of bump to rebound. Uh, ultimately what we're trying to do is end up with something that actually does look reasonably similar to this, sort of a, uh, a normal distribution curve uh, where it's even in bump and rebound. We can see that we've got that there on the front left and also the left rear. Uh, everything's not looking quite as even over on the right hand side. Haven't dived into that in too much detail but this is the sort of information you can get if you've got the benefit of having those shock travel potentiometers. Um, on top of this as well, it's worth mentioning here that this will give you a guide to the relationship between your bump and rebound damping, but it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that your bump and rebound damping is perfect. You can obviously also stiffen and soften the bump and rebound both together and still end up with a normal distribution curve that looks perfect. So there's still a lot of the driver input and feedback from the stopwatch that actually comes into play when actually optimizing uh, your uh, bump and rebound settings on your dampers. But definitely this is a bit more of a guide. It gives you a little bit more of an idea than just solely relying on driver feedback. So a lot more to dive into uh, as we get a little bit more involved with the car. Again, uh, back to the track tomorrow with a little bit more testing. Uh, we want to try and get as much testing under our belt as possible before we do head into that first round. And again, for those who have follow us, followed us over the last year, you'll know that our season last year did not go to plan. Uh, we are really hopeful that we're going to have a better season this year. Certainly at least four weeks out. Last time we didn't even have an engine in the car, so we're well ahead of the game in that respect. Uh, but a lot uh, of things to still go on before we can actually load up and head to the first round. Uh, now this is actually a good uh, good time to talk about an Instagram that I put up just recently uh, that really sort of feeds into our discussion today around torque management. This is a shot that I took at World Time Attack a couple of years back of the Scorch Racing uh, Nissan S15 that runs in the open class and Obviously one of the problems we see with fitting larger turbos to engines is that while we're going to end up making a lot more power at high RPM, the bigger the turbo, obviously the more lag we end up with. So interesting uh, option that Scorch Racing have used, as we can see in here, we've got a nitrous fogger uh, nozzle. So this is mounted pre-throttle, uh, it's only a single fogger, normally as well just uh, for those who aren't aware the fogger nozzle from NOS there normally introduces both fuel and nitrous, there's jets inside behind those blue anodized fittings uh, that you can change in order to adjust how much nitrous and fuel is delivered and the idea if you are running both the fuel and nitrous into this fogger is that it will maintain a consistent air fuel ratio or safe air fuel ratio when the nitrous is activated. These days with modern aftermarket ECUs we normally have more control by using the ECU and the main injectors to actually introduce the required additional fuel which is why you can see here that uh, only nitrous is being delivered. Uh, now the idea is pretty straightforward here when the driver goes to full throttle at low RPM and the engine is off boost uh, normally we'd end up with quite a period of lag maybe uh, depending on the RPM might be five six tenths of a second 
second before we get back to full boost, maybe even longer. Uh, so by activating the nitrous as soon as the driver goes past perhaps 80% throttle, uh, what that's going to do is introduce the nitrous into the engine. Now you only really need a relatively small shot for this to work, even uh, just 50 to 70 horsepower does quite an amazing job. Now obviously when we introduce that nitrous it creates a larger combustion event which in turn provides more exhaust gas energy. So this is what helps spool the turbocharger up, plus of course as soon as that nitrous is active the engine is physically producing more power. Once the turbo starts to spool though it becomes sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy and we end up with more inlet charge, more power, more exhaust gas energy, more boost. So what we can get just with that nitrous shot, even 50 to 70 horsepower as I've said, uh, we can basically get almost instantaneous boost response. But the other advantage with this is that we don't need to spray the nitrous the whole time. We can deactivate the nitrous essentially as soon as the engine gets past maybe uh, 60 or 70 percent of our boost target and then uh, that means that we are quite uh, economical with our nitrous use. Downside uh, is that this is limited to some particular racing classes so at least here in New Zealand our local motorsport governing body Motorsport New Zealand does ban the use of nitrous for I think just about everything with the exception of drifting uh, and of course there are other classes like World Time Attack in the Open class, Pikes Peak is another area that we personally used it as well in the Unlimited class uh, so there are options but of course uh, probably pay to check your governing body's rules before you jump in to that. Now I just want to quickly talk <coughs> excuse me, about uh, a project we do have coming up. Uh, again if you follow us for a while you will know that we are in the midst of building a 4G63 Evo 9 engine for a project car we've got on the way. This will be going into our practical engine building course as a worked example. It's nothing particularly over the top, we're looking for a good solid all round street performer. So we're not looking for maximum power at high RPM, what we want is a really nice broad power curve, torque curve and uh, what we've chosen for that application it's a 2.2 litre stroker kit using a manly billet crankshaft. Uh, we've got a 9 to 1 compression JE forged piston which will work well on both E85 as well as pump gas and we've got a CNC ported cylinder head from horsepower heads here in New Zealand uh, that's mated up to a set of oversized Fourier valves, one millimeter oversized Fourier valves and a set of GSC Power Division S2 cams. We're still retaining the MyVec which is going to help give us uh, that wider power band for those who aren't from the Mitsubishi fraternity. MyVec is simply Mitsubishi's version of variable valve timing so we can advance and retard the intake cam uh, while the engine is actually running. One of the biggest parts though choosing uh, or getting a good wide power band is the turbo selection and there are understandably literally hundreds of turbos out there on the market that could uh, be adapted to the 4G63 uh, and all of them have their pros and cons. Uh, so I'll jump across to my laptop screen. Uh, what we're trying out and it'll be my first time using one is an intense turbo uh, out of Australia. These are a stock uh, frame turbo so stock location basically they bolt straight on to the factory exhaust manifold and from the outside do look like a stock turbocharger. Uh, they are available in a variety of sizes in particular here they go from 575 horsepower up to 725 horsepower. This is another one of those cases where bigger isn't always better so we've actually decided we're going to go for the intense 5556 RS uh, which is rated up to 625 horsepower. My aim here is to have a power band that's going to run out from about 4000 through to about 8000 RPM uh, with an engine bay that's going to look relatively unmolested uh, when the, uh, the, the bonnet is popped so we've got a very stock look in there. Uh, one of the parts we are going to be using in conjunction with that though if we go to our overhead here is this Hypertune uh, exhaust manifold so this is made for the stock turbocharger uh, so it'll work just as nicely with your factory turbocharger. Uh, it uses uh, the uh, cast collector as well so uh, one of the nice features there is uh, with the cast collector 
it aids the uh, fabrication process so it's much faster to build one of these. Uh, it's also easier often with a cast collector to actually optimise the flow rather than fab from fabricated parts. Uh, but the other advantage there is uh, the collector is one of the parts generally where a fabricated manifold is prone to failure. Uh, so again look at back to back tests, the Hypertune manifold and similar manifolds to this uh, have shown a reasonable improvement in performance over the stock manifold. So basically just about optimising the flow into that, uh, into that intense turbocharger and then we'll obviously be mating that with a freer flowing exhaust system as well to try and optimise the flow out. So uh, pretty excited to uh, bring that to fruition, uh, car is probably still uh, a month or so away from making it to us and we've got that engine coming back from our machinist in the next week or so, uh, so hopefully that worked example on the 4G63 will be out in the next month or two uh, and if you don't have an Evo 9 don't worry a lot of similarities between all of the 4G63 models even back to the older 6 bolt variants so there's a lot of information in there that's going to be useful uh, irrespective of which model of 4G63 you're personally interested in uh, you'll be able to find that at hbacademy.com forward slash courses and it is our practical engine building course. Uh, just a reminder on our podcast as well if you have been hiding under a rock we do have our HPA Tech Talk podcast uh, the latest episode of that was an interview we had with Devin Schultz from Boost and Performance when we were over at TX2K. Uh, Devin is probably best known for their Red Demon which is currently, if my memory serves correct, still uh, the fastest Mitsubishi Evo four wheel drive. Uh, bear with me because I know that times and mile an hour do change. I think uh, generally, generally around the time that this was recorded, uh, 704 at 204 mile an hour. And I know Devin's been back to the track just recently. I don't think he's gone quicker on ET, but dangerously close to that six second uh, quarter mile. So if you want to learn a little bit more about what goes into tuning something like that, as well as all of the other cars that uh, Boost and Performance are involved with, check that out. You can find it at hpatechtalk.com uh, or you can find it at anywhere you will listen to podcasts anyway. Uh, I've got a new episode comes out every two weeks and if you leave us a review uh, you'll go into an, uh, the draw to win an HPA t-shirt which will ship free of charge to your door. We're drawing one of those uh, out every month. I Sorry not every two weeks we bring out a new podcast every week. I should probably know more about our podcast. So and again uh, check out hpatechtalk.com if you want to learn more. All uh, right lastly for today uh, last video that we have just released on our YouTube channel if we head over to the my laptop screen uh, sim racing. So this actually really coincides with our latest course release which uh, was from our racecraft project which we've now moved merged into HPA. So this is our race driving fundamentals course so if you are interested in learning how to become quicker on the racetrack uh, that course is going to be perfect for you but a big part of that is around uh, using simulators. So obviously track time is expensive and simulators these days have come a long way and it has become something that is actually a genuine training tool uh, and it can save you a lot of track time and give you a lot more experience uh, particularly if you're learning a new track as well. Now I know that uh, at least as I've sort of grown up we sort of started out with Gran Turismo and admittedly a lot of those earlier uh, racing games were just that a game. Uh, these days though with the likes of iRacing, Assetto Corsa, R Factor we've actually got some uh, genuine simulation software now as opposed to just games and it gives you a lot of flexibility to both learn about a track particularly with iRacing for example all of the race tracks are laser scan and what that means is that the track surface is completely accurate to the actual race track. All of the little bumps, undulations and hollows that are there in the real world, they also exist in the uh, the, the iRacing version as well. So uh, if you are familiar with the track it really should feel like you are racing at that track. So really powerful for learning a new track. We personally used uh, Assetto Corsa uh, last year or year before last before we started the South Island Endurance Racing Championship. Particularly 
particularly because we had only raced at one of the tracks that we were going to visit. Uh, so a set of Corsa had gave us access to the other tracks we hadn't visited, probably put in a few hundred laps. And when we got to the track, it really did feel like I already knew my way around, uh, at least kind of had a really good idea of what the key corners are and what the driving lines were going to be. Uh, also, if you're interested in car setup, uh, good quality simulation software like iRacing does give you the ability to get really down in the weeds with small intricate car setup changes. And again, these do or should react fairly similar to real life changes. Uh, one of the keys just from my own experience with simulation now, uh, we've got a simulator at work, I've got my own one at home. And uh, obviously you can throw a huge amount of money at your sim setup and it can be tempting just to continually pour money into it and I, I think probably the key that I wanted to give here just from my own experience is uh, with the parts that we've changed uh, I would say that the biggest single change that I've made is good quality load cell pedals they've really transformed particularly driving a car with no ABS it's really transformed the amount of feel and the amount of modulation you get I've also gone from a relatively cost-effective Logitech wheel to a more expensive uh, SimuCube direct drive wheel. That was definitely a step up but if I had to choose one of those two uh, I'd definitely go the pedals every time. All right, that brings us to the end of our pre-show there. Thanks for watching. If you just give me a moment we'll get started with today's lesson. If you like that video make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.